Hello and welcome to the ninth episode of Tech Horizons. My name is Madeleine Skillen. I'm the Regional Marketing Manager at Procore Technologies. And today I'm joined by Basil Tashwali, Construction Technology Specialist who's been in the region for the last 10 years. Hi Basil, how are you today? Hello Madeleine, I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me here today. You're very welcome. Could you just, to kickstart off the conversation, just give me a brief overview of your background and then also what attracted you to this part of the industry? By profession, I'm an architect. Um, I grew up here in, in Dubai and I studied here. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have an early entry uh, into, into the construction industry and specifically into modern methods of construction um, around 18 years old. And uh, honestly, it, uh, modern methods of construction just seemed like a more organized and, and better way to, to, to build and a more sustainable way. Um, when I got exposed to factory environments and I, I saw the, the, the high quality production that was taking place in, in factories versus the chaotic uh, kind of construction sites mm. that we are all used to, it was almost a no brainer. Mm. And in terms of the ways in which different companies you've seen implement and go about implementing these uh, modern technologies, for example, and these modern methods, how do you think different companies vary across the region? Um, so in, in since about 2017, we've seen a, a considerable spike in, in giga projects and there, there has been a crazy amount of demand and strain on the construction industry to, to uh, uh, cater for these projects. So uh, w with this spike of demand, um, a lot of companies were uh, kind of pushed to, to accept and to, to uh, adopt modern methods of construction and construction technologies because it seemed to be the only way. Uh, contractors could not attend to the remote locations these projects were taken, uh, were, were built at. Uh, the fast track uh, env environment and nature of these projects and the high quality demanded. So with, with that in mind, uh, methods like modular construction, prefabricated solutions and construction automation seemed like the only way uh, contractors could attend to these projects. Um, moreover, modular construction brought about a, a an interesting phenomenon into these uh, into these giga projects uh, in the recent years, uh, which was the ability to import and export constructions. Right, mm -hmm. because uh, at at this time and age, we are literally importing our buildings from all across the globe. Um, we have um, hotels being imported from Europe, from the U.S., from even all the way to in in Mexico, uh, and and stacked and uh, in, in the most remote deserts, on top of mountains, to, to build these constructions and cater for these giga projects. So it's really opening the doors up to innovation in terms of being able to achieve what was perhaps unachievable before. Absolutely. Just because of the mobility. Absolutely. Um, it, it really provided a, a, a more dynamic environment for, for construction. More activities are now taking place in parallel. More opportunities are, are now readily available to people across the globe. A, a construction market within this region is no longer just simply regional. Uh, it is open for players uh, all across the globe. Mm -hmm. um, you know, via construction technologies, people are even working, uh, you know, design teams globally on, on, on unified uh, models, you know, um, factories contributing with, with high level of co coordination to a single building. It's uh, honestly really an exciting time to be in the construction industry. Do you think, I'm going to mention COVID now, do you think that COVID helped to um, spur that movement on further just because it forced us to start working in a, remote, in a more remote dynamic environment and indeed like in terms of even just connecting with people around the globe in real time, it certainly helped to accelerate that movement? Um, see, here's the thing. I, I always say... Um, COVID-19 has been the pivotal point for construction technology and, and especially regionally. It was almost like a forced proof of concept, mm. uh, you know, with, with the um, super st stringent um, regulations imposed on the construction industry regarding hygiene and safety and, and distancing. 
factories were the only entities capable of uh, f- uh, capable of adopting these stringent regula- uh, regulations while maintaining their efficient uh, efficiency and regularly delivering projects mm-hmm. so you know I, in my opinion uh, modern methods of construction were crowned king uh, during covid-19 and was um, uh, that duration the year 2020 was almost a like a wake up call for the for the construction industry that you know these technologies are no longer just an additional tool they are the more efficient or the way to go uh, forward I really like that phrase that you just said modern methods of construction and technology were crowned king as a result of COVID-19. <laughs> um, it's a very interesting phrase that you use. And I think sometimes now with so past COVID-19, we don't like to refer back to it, but it was such a turning point for us within the industry. Absolutely. Um, I, I mean, there was, uh, you know, a, comp- a high strain on, on supply chains. There was shortage of materials, um, you know, delivering to, to remote locations was becoming absolutely more difficult. Um, a lot of a lot of changes really happened. Even manpower was, uh, you know, obtaining manpower for projects was was very, very difficult during that period of time. You're quite passionate about 3D printing as well off the back of our conversation. Could you explain a little bit of how that's being adopted by the industry? Um, see, I, I always I always say this to, to clients, to, to colleagues, there isn't one technology that is the absolute salvation for, for all uh, construction challenges. Each, each technology came about to, to kind of serve a specific purpose with advantages and disadvantages. And there has been a lot of hype around 3D printing, you know, just because we used to printing things on a paper and now we're seeing, you know, buildings coming out of a, of a similar process. Um, but 3D printing came about for very, very specific uses. Um, the, the technology is super capable of developing very complicated structures uh, with very minimal uh, inter, uh, intervention of uh, of people of human intervention and and that gave about possibility especially for architects architects absolutely love such technologies because now their designs can become more organic they they don't have to worry about material wastage because everything is just absolutely tailor made to their millimeters uh, dubai has witnessed a very uh, considerable increase in 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 the number of 3d printed build, uh, printed buildings there is approximately uh, as of today 15 uh, buildings that have been printed ever since the uh, the, um, the publication of the royal decree regarding regulating the use of 3D printing um, on a global level. There, are, um, you know, countries with specifically with the with the ones with high co- cost of manpower, mm-hmm. labor uh, labor cost like Europe, the US, um, 3D printing has has proven to be extremely successful because it greatly reduced uh, the the use of manpo- manpower for up to 70%. Wow, so, uh, 70%. Yeah, 70%. Because what takes about, uh, you know, 80, 80 people to, to build takes about like five mm-hmm. to, to, to do with the 3D printer. It's merely just supervision. I don't imagine many people driving around Dubai recognize that they're probably passing by a 3D printed building. Yeah, it is. Um, I've, I've actually experienced that firsthand with, with friends and, you know, driving about. You have the, um, the office of the future. You have Dubai Municipality's building. Um, actually, Dubai just issued a, a building permit for the first privately owned home and occupied uh, 3D uh, that was 3D printed. Um, I think that was finished as of October last year. Now you grew up in the region, you've been in the industry for the last 10 years, no doubt you have witnessed rapid evolution across, you know, not just the UAE, but across the whole of the Middle East. From your experience, what specific project have you seen to be most successful in terms of the adoption of technology, um, but also in terms of like the forward thinkingness of all of those working on the project? Um, So... I honestly, my favorite project when it comes to 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 adopting technology has been the Turtle Bay Hotel 
uh, by the Red Sea, uh, Red sea Global. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to work on, on two sides during the project. I was working with a company called Dubox, which was responsible for building the concrete modular construction uh, uh, hotel. And I was, I was also working with a sister company called Dupod that was uh, responsible for building the bathroom pods. Now, what was special about this project is because it really pushed the boundaries of utilizing construction technology and it's really flexed its abilities. Um, one of uh, some of the most considerable, uh, you know, points in, in, in the in the project was the the project actually uh, started construction while the the site was undergoing soil improvement. So there was no infrastructure, there were no roads yet. But since the building was being built in a factory environment, there was absolutely no issue going in parallel and, and building the, the building at the same time they're improving the soil. So um, as we all know, that's actually absolutely not possible with conventional construction. So that caters for this increase in, uh, in speed. Mm -hmm. um, another important uh, and, and actually super interesting and my favorite part of the project was that the project involved the hotel rooms being built in Saudi Arabia using precast concrete while the bathroom pods were built in in a factory in in Dubai uh, using steel structure and then we shipped the bathroom from Dubai to Saudi Arabia we put the the bathroom pod inside the concrete box so box in a box and then ship that all the way to site and stack them to make the hotel so the bathroom was built in parallel to the hotel room, which was also built in parallel to the site. So the, the project duration was was almost squeezed into a fraction. And finally, I mean, we've we've always sp spoken about the importance of BIM and you know cloud uh, cloud data. But during this project, we had design teams working in in these factories in our corporate division. So we had about four or five design teams in in different geographical locations working on a on a single model that coordinated all these fabrications. And um, to, to me, honestly, being able to to achieve such a complex, uh, highly coordinated uh, project with teams across the uh, across the globe was was the real power of construction technology. It blows my mind. I don't think that 30 years ago we probably could have ever thought that this would have been possible. Um, so it's it just goes to show what we could achieve in the future as things start to ramp up technologically. With all this in mind, though, why do you think people are reluctant to implement the technology despite all of the benefits that we're now realising? Um, see, most people kind of argue that it's the the cost the cost of implementation or the ROI. Um, honestly, I, I think I have a more philosophical answer to this because it 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 uh, kind of goes back to human nature. Generally speaking, uh, any technology, uh, any dis dis disruption requires a cultural shift mm -hmm. or a, a kind of mindset change to f for it to be efficiently impl implemented. Um, Think of the first iPhone when it came about with no physical buttons. Mm -hmm. There was plenty of resistance towards, you know, using that phone. Everyone was like, no, I'm used to texting with buttons. You know, it doesn't feel the same. Those people are now history, right? We, we have seen the, the fall of many, many uh, phone manufacturers and, you know, diluting these companies just because they did not uh, go with the development of, of, of these technologies. The same applies in the cons in the construction industry, right? Mm -hmm. Any technology implementation has a, 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 a generally high learning curve associated with it, mm -hmm. and we generally fear what we what we don't understand. And in 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 my opinion, the ability to learn is generally associated with being young. So you know, and we we fear being you know kind of uh, getting old, being irrelevant, you know, we don't understand this, do we really need it? But this has been working out so so far. So generally, I, I keep pushing people, you know, you don't have to be, you know, you, you, we can stay young, we can continue learning mm -hmm. and adopt these technologies. So I think it, it really goes back to the, the, the high learning uh, curve associated with technology adoption. I think especially when you start talking about technology replacing. Absolutely. Uh, people people, laborers, I think that's when people start to get a little bit knocked. 
by it as well. Instead of seeing, okay, this is an opportunity for me to evolve into a different role or amend my skill set, they see it as a complete replacement and I'm going to get wiped off. And it doesn't have to be that way. There are opportunities to kind of then start broadening because technology isn't going to be able to do everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's usually um, the, the initial reaction the um the initial panic mm -hmm. you know if you want to call it it's uh you know pe whenever people you know realize that this specific skill is no longer required mm -hmm. and they, they immediately go well, what should i do now you know how will i lose my job but i think it's on construction technology professionals to to educate the market to to you know engage all stakeholders and to to kind of ease them in to to make opportunities clearly visible, shed some light on, on, on these opportunities, uh, collaborate with academia to introduce these technologies into, into that field. So there's a higher level of awareness and hopefully a reduction in, in this in initial panic. Building upon that then, you touched upon maybe uh, leadership, leading the way and helping to educate a workforce, um, very much comforting them in the change. What other adoption strategies do you think companies can implement to ease that transition to a more tech forward way of working? Um, see, with, with innovation management, um, there, there are plenty of tools and you, you, you really need to, to work around these tools based on the culture of the company, right? It depends on whether the demographic is a, a young demographic, is it an old demographic in the country, you know, they, they would re react differently. But in, in, in general terms, I think, uh, I, I always say this, you know, keep it simple, stupid, right? Construction technology is generally complex to, to newcomers. Uh, as it is. So don't try to overwhelm them with technology because we love buzzwords and construction technology, mm. right? We, we we love giving things names, BIM, VDC, AI, right? All sh these short forms and people just hear things they don't understand and they panic. Mm. So, you know, keep it simple, make it, you know, user friendly, phase it in. Don't, you know, don't try to, to, to kind of achieve everything at the first go. No big bangs. Please. No one likes big changes, right? Yeah. Everyone kind of panics. No one likes walking into their routine office, having their, you know, coffee in the morning. And now we're going to do things differently. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone gets scared. So phasing, I would say incremental improvements. Your first go is never going to resolve the problem. Most people want to have the perfect launch on, on their, on their, you know, innovation strategy. That will never happen, right? You're just going to delay. You're going to overwork people mm -hmm. and you're going to shock them. So incremental change is, is always best. And, um, Establish your chi champions. So find people who are interested in technology uh, within the organization, even subcontractors, even within your clients. Having your clients engage with your technology adoption is super important. These champions are going to be the, the, your salespeople. They speak the language of your stakeholders and they will be able to deliver the message usually be better than a construction technology because we're uh, specialists, because we're fairly taken taken away by the things we're passionate by. So your champions are always gonna be your salespeople. Mm -hmm. We touched upon earlier on governance and modern methods of construction, but it'd be interesting to just delve into that a little bit further um, and ask you, where do you think the gap is currently in bridging or rather that needs to be bridged between modern methods of construction and governance? Absolutely. That's that's actually a very interesting question because um, people people generally tend to kind of, uh, we always like to throw the, our, the responsibility on somebody or put the blame on somebody. And it's very easy to, to uh, put that load on government bodies because they're there to ensure our safety and protection. But I think if, if we look, look at that, uh, at the timeline from a macro level, you, we will realize that technologies generally come about to resolve a specific problem. So it comes from within the industry, right? Someone develops a solution to cater for a specific need and resolve a specific challenge. Mm -hmm. And regulations come about uh, to, to ensure everyone's safety and protection while using this technology. So in principle, uh, governance is a reactive force while 
developing technologies is a proactive force, right? So, um, you know, between the two, there will be a, a gap in the timeline, right? There will be a period of time where it's the Wild West in implementing the specific technology. And this gap is where pioneers and early adopters and early birds are born, right? The, the people who believe, the people who are usually called crazy, you know, when, when adopting any technology. And um, I think they are, it's, it's on them to, to kind of push this technology uh, forward. Um, it's also important to remember that governing bodies are there to support us. So, you know, I always communicate, uh, I'm sorry, I always recommend to, 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 uh, to colleagues, clients, etc., to do the, the you know, a ver the famous three C's, connect, communicate, collaborate, right? Connect with government bodies, with houses of expertise, entities like ICC, ACM, etc., right? Um, communicate your technology, communicate what you're trying to do, communicate what, what this technology will bring about. Be very wary of local codes, local government agendas. Position your technology in such a way that it serves the, the needs of the city. And finally, finally, collaborate with these entities in launching pilot project, providing them with the necessary data and learning curve to successfully regulate this technology and support its implementation. And um, I think if we follow that path rather than, you know, always blaming entities that they're behind, uh, it would lead to a much, fruit, uh, a much more fruitful implementation of technologies in the industry. I agree. And I think that it's quite lazy for people to sometimes blame the entities and expect a proactivity when really they should own that Absolutely. themselves. And that applies to, you know, the software vendors as well. Absolutely. I think software vendors really need to be more proactive in trying to push that industry and working with the entities as well to consider the alignment so that they can be in sync when these things you know, take place and there's needs within the industry that need to be met. Absolutely. And I, I mean, let's not forget, uh, you know, early birds, you know, get the most benefits once the technology are regulated. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they will get earn the fruits of the, their labor. So it's an initial investment, but it will pay off eventually. Yeah. Early bird catches the worm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, Talking about staying updated then with emerging technologies, because there are so many <laughs> emerging technologies. There's <laughs> tons of startups. Um, there's those that are a little bit more established within the market, but they're always developing their products. Um, there's movements that are separate to products in themselves. How do you stay on top of it all? Because that's your specialty. You're a construction technology specialist. What's your secret sauce? What's... What, how do you keep on top and keep your finger on the pulse? Honestly, that's the toughest part of my job. <laughs> it's, um, it, it's, you know, there, there is no specific way other than being active, I, I would say, in, in the industry. Uh, if, if I would kind of uh, nail it down, I would, uh, you know, recommend staying close to academia. Academia is generally, um, you know, the, the, the cradle of the development of, uh, of, of these technologies. They, they kind of research, collaborate with entities. Um, ha always have a, a, an improvement, a continuous improvement division within the organization. And please, not within the project environment. People in project environments always have their head in the project uh, uh, requirements, right? They don't. They they are completely blind to to the processes within the organization. So having people dedicated to studying the processes, understanding people's problems, and uh, trying to come up with with improvement cycles, and uh, you know conduct the necessary research and development to resolve them will go a long way. Um, network, diversify your recruitment people do things surprisingly differently globally, right? And, uh, you know, as they say, new blood will always bring, um, you know, positive, bring about positive change. Mm -hmm. And as cliche as it sounds, but it's super powerful, bring in the youth, you know? They are the most disruptive. They will always say things you don't like, but <laughs> with the necessary, <laughs> guide, with, with, the, with the right guidance, um, their their contribution will go a long way because generally 
they they you know, you know I always say they haven't been tainted by by the industry, mm-hmm. um, and with the with the with the right mentorship, they can really help uh, grow grow any any construction business. I think the youth are a force to be reckoned with, especially the generation that are coming through Generation Z, where they are, what's the word? Um, probably far more confident in expressing their views than previous generations, I would Absolutely. say. And you see that level of confidence grow as each generation. You see millennials often more confident than the baby boomers and then post that as well with the Gen Zs. Um, and they grew up with technology. We talk about the fact that they're digitally native. Absolutely. Uh, they're adaptable in a different way. Absolutely. Um, but again, as well, the recruitment thing is a very interesting point. The biggest difference I've noticed in recruitment over here versus recruitment maybe in Europe is that here they will find somebody with the exact skill set that they're looking for to fulfill the job role within the job description. In Europe, there's a little bit more flexibility, I would say, and they'll take people from a little bit more of a diverse background. Uh, and that brings some real benefits to it so you know maybe that's the way that within the middle east we need to start being a bit more open to that i think uh i I completely agree with that approach and i think recognizing your talent pool within the organization is super important um you know uh, remembering that people are more than just the degrees they that they hold is crucial when it comes to innovation right um you know we're talking you know off um b- before the 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 podcast you, you were telling me very few people know that i paint right mm-hmm. and 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 i mean that's that's a talent by by itself and and it could definitely contribute to a specific thing within the the organization uh that that you work with uh I, i'm not sure how far gardening goes <laughs> in the construction <laughs> industry but um, um understanding the people's talents um, someone who works in operations might be a very good speaker and is brilliant at marketing mm. uh, and, and and public relations. Someone in design could uh, be a great communicator at site. Mm. So giving people the opportunity to flourish be- beyond their job titles uh, will definitely go a long way in a business. Yeah, absolutely. I did a degree in human geography in French. And now I work in marketing and have worked in technology ever since the start of my career. See, that's a prime example right there. <laughs> yeah. You know, and being a marketer, you have to be, you know, innately intrigued by the world around you. And studying a degree in human geography really helped build those firm foundations. So I think but nobody would have put those two, Absolutely. two together. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, I... I I guess it's it's on people like you to 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 share that experience, and I'm glad that you shared that uh, right here on 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 the podcast because that that is really a prime example of of you know what we study. Our degree does not always have to be the limit of what we can deliver, right? And uh, really, it's on the businesses to to kind of open that gateway for 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 that talent to flourish. In terms of the regulatory framework then and policies, how do you think the regulatory framework is encouraging the usage of construction technology? So um, in, in the recent years, we have seen regulations move from a system-based uh, regulation. So meaning in, in more specific terms, um, you know, concrete should be of X, Y, Z performance with X, Y, Z rebars and, uh, you know, tensile strength, et cetera, to a more performance driven uh, requirements, meaning that instead of it being concrete, it whatever material you're going to use needs to satisfy these requirements. Now, what this does is it, it completely removes the, the requirement for a specific building system it, and it allows the use of uh, almost anything, sky's the limit, as long as it satisfies these requirements. I think that by itself has been the most important and pivotal change in, in the way we see regulations, that it's not about the concrete, it's not about the steel that we've been using for 100 years, <laughs> it's just about the performance. It could be paper for all we care, right? So uh, I think that was the first pivotal point. The second pivotal point would be um, understanding that 
there's almost a translator <laughs> requirement, a translation requirement for, mod, uh, for modern methods constru uh, of construction, uh, sorry, between modern methods of construction and building codes. Mm -hmm. So we have seen entities uh, like the ICC issue guidelines, the biomunicipality issued guidelines for 3D printing, uh, which actually serves as a bridge between the, the performance requirements of building, uh, of building codes and the language that these, these specialists speak, mm -hmm. right? So it, it kind of tells them this is how you meet these performance requirements via the specific technology, it's rather than the entities trying to prove that their technology meets the requirement. So um, I think government, governance has, has gone a long way in understanding that the construction industry is, is uh, ever growing and ever changing. And definitely in the past 10 years, in a much more rapid rate than it did, uh, I would say in the past 50 previous years. And far more flexible if it's just performance based. And like you said, you know, you can, as long as you're getting to point A, it doesn't really matter how you get there. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the, the, the governance has, has stripped down uh, the engineering process into a more native, uh, more uh, physics-based, for lack of a better word, uh, form. Um, you know, people are really kind of uh, trying to focus on the the material science behind uh, be, be behind the systems, the uh, the performances, rather than you know brick and mortar, concrete, rebars, uh, kind of approach in construction. So it feels like the industry is becoming more creative then. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, uh, government, bo government bodies are even recognizing technologies as young as AI. So, um, I mean, AI has been a, a recent buzzword. Just I, I think it's much beyond the, the, the buzz that it's cre creating. Uh, it can be utilized in, in many different ways. Government bodies has published bots to support engineers and their processes. Uh, I mean, in today's world, sky's been the limit with, with, with technology. Mm. With that in mind, then, how do you foresee the future of construction with the aid of technology? In 10 years' time, where do you think we're going to be? Um, I mean, in, in, in the recent years, uh, studies have shown a, a significant uh, shift in value investment value pool from con conventional constructions and uh, actually conventional construction and, and, and digital solutions to industrial methods mm -hmm. and uh, more sophisticated uh, digital solutions beyond just BIM. So initially it was conventional construction, then BIM came about. BIM shows the introduction of big data in the, in the world of, 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 of construction uh, and then came about you know, the use of industrial methods, 3D printing, pre pre prefabrication. So that th there was that shift. There was the introduction of trends like, you know, construction 5.0, which now brings in about the technologies like IOTs and automation, along with a more responsible uh, more responsible KPIs, ESG requirements, uh, sustainability requirements, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're calling it you know, construction 5.0. So the way that I see the, the industry moving forward would be toward a more responsible uh, approach in construction. Uh, I mean, commercials will always play a role, right? Uh, but, you know, we're, we're slowly recognizing the importance of quality of living. And as you said earlier, uh, the new generations are coming about with, with you know, with high access to, to technology and, and data. So they are growing to become a, to become much more responsible adults than than we did. I mean, we we were taught so little about the environment at the early stages, and and my nephew is telling me is teaching me about global warming. To to be very honest, so um, I, I would see it continuing towards technology adoption adoption, but in a more responsible and more uh, environmentally kind of serving manner. Your nephew is teaching you a lot about global warming uh, no doubt along with lots of other things just like my niece and nephew do they like to give me a lesson in a plethora of different subjects I think they're becoming a lot more demanding as well as those generations grow up of what they expect of the companies in terms of what's their environmental stance um, you know what's their political stance what's their governmental stance etc the sustainability stance it, 
all of that. Um, so companies will have to meet those demands in order to maintain a healthy flow of labour. Um, so it's, it's, like I said earlier on, younger generations are now far more confident. They're far more knowledgeable. They have access to data at the fingertips. You know, they all have iPads or tablets. And there's even software now with games. They've gamified a lot of these kind of thought leadership topics as well from a younger age. So it will be very interesting to see how that curve continues moving forwards. Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, most most young, uh, the, 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 most of the re- recent youth are are more well versed with with technologies like a, uh, like AI than than most adults. I mean, um, the other day I was sitting with my nephew, and and he's. He, he's a prompt engineer, to be to be honest. He uses uh, technologies like ChatGPT way better than me, you know. And and he was sitting about showing me that, you know, you 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 can actually, you know, tell it to to work like us, for example, like an engineer, talk like a scientist. And he was kind of clarifying, you know, you don't have to write all that, just use these prompts and everything. And, you know, looking at, at the recent, now we're seeing job openings for like, you know, uh, AI prompt specialists, right? Uh, the construction and the 3D printing is bringing about like uh, mechatronics engineers. So these are all job, job roles not native to the construction in- industry, right? So um, I think there, there, there are exciting times coming ahead in the construction industry. And it's definitely, uh, we're definitely living in an interesting uh, t- time in this industry. And if your nephew came up to you and said, Uncle Basil, <laughs> what advice will you give to me? I want, I want a career in construction. What advice could you give to me? Stay away from it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I mean, construction is beautiful. I I, I would do it again, all, all over again. I just no regrets. The heat. Yeah, absolutely no regrets. Um, I, honestly, I, I would say diversify your experience. I, I was fortunate enough to play different roles in design operations, innovation management, and, and most recently working with a government body. And... Honestly, over the years, that ha- that has really educated me in how little I knew of dif- uh, f- of different people's perspectives. So I think early on, you know, don't worry about having all the knowledge. Diversify your experience. Uh, listen to to all all stakeholders. Everyone matters in in the industry. And you know, as you go forward all these ex- experiences will provide you with the necessary insight to to push any technology forward and most importantly speak everyone's language because if if you cannot speak the other side's language that you you stand no chance in convincing them um so diversify and never stop learning i i think to summarize that Thank you so much for joining me today. I've learned an incredible amount. I've been working in construction technology for a while now, but I feel like I'm walking away with real you know, nuggets of, of knowledge there. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'm no doubt the listeners will scrape a huge amount of insight as well from our conversation. And I really can't wait to sit you down in the future and have this conversation all again and discuss what's happened from now until then. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It was It was a pleasure. Uh, I, I really hope the listeners enjoy and, uh, you know, reach out as well. It's all about networking and uh, supporting one another. Um, so thank you so much for, for, for having me. I'm You're very welcome. humbled. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.